Good morning. This, today's sermon passage is a familiar one. It's the parable of the sheep and the goats. Hear this good word from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, for the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whenever you did it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So, as I was getting ready this week for the sermon, I, I was looking at my Facebook, and I noticed that I had posted something a couple of years ago, uh, a video about a young boy named Daniel who was Down syndrome, and he's 17, and he wanted to go to his homecoming dance so badly. And so Daniel asked several girls if they would go with him to the dance, and they all declined. And as you can imagine, that would be horrible, and he was heartbroken. And what he was feeling is the, the, the severity of being stigmatized by his peers. Well, not long after that, a young 10th grader named Kylie stepped up, and she asked Daniel to the homecoming dance. And of course, he accepted it. And she had hoped that she would be able to bring him some fun. And here's what I love about this story from Kylie, because this is what she said about human beings in general. I don't think of kids that have a disability. I don't think of them as being different. I hope I can make his night fun. So, it was time for the big night, and Daniel's looking spectacular in his dress shirt and suspenders and his bow tie and all dressed up. She comes walking in in a beautiful dress, and there they are, getting ready to go off on the big night. Well, what they did not know is that a local news station heard about this, and they call it the Surprise Squad. And so as they're getting ready for the big night, the surprise squad shows up. And that's the reason why we have the video, right? Because otherwise, we, none of us would have known about this. And so the news team says to them, hey, we heard about what you guys are doing and that you're out for the homecoming dance and we wanted to celebrate with you, but we wanted to add a little bit to your night. So they said, you won't be going to the dance in your parents' cars. You'll be going in a black Rolls Royce limousine. And up comes the limousine. 
And not only that, then the limousine would be taking them out to a high-end restaurant in their neighborhood. As, as Daniel's mom says in the video, we would never be able to afford to go to this restaurant. And there they are having this incredible feast, right? And the owner of the restaurant comes in and says, order anything you want from the menu as much as you like. It's all on us. And if you thought that wasn't enough, when they arrived at the homecoming dance, the Fox Squad team had arranged a red carpet event so that they were able to walk into the dance in a red carpet. And there's some other great surprises, too, that I'm not going to give away at this point. We've included the link to the video in our, uh, in, in our email to you, and hopefully it will be on the web page, too. But please take a look at it. And I promise you, any of you who look at this video and you don't start tearing up and get a little verklempt at some point, I, I don't know then what you're made of. But I share this story because when I see it, I see something like this. It just, everything in my whole body and mind and spirit just seems to well up with, with joy and happiness and, and tears and love. So why is it that when we see these incredible acts of kindness like this, that it, it touches us so deeply? Likewise, when we see somebody being cruel to another person, it, and it triggers an incredible outrage in our soul and our spirit, we, what, what causes this? I mean, it's more than just, isn't that sweet, isn't that nice? Oh, that was entertaining. That, no, I'm talking about when we see people behaving and with an incredible kindness and generosity. It touches us. Why is that? I believe it's because of our soul, of our spirit, that part of us which I believe to be eternal, that part of us which is connected to the divine and the divine in us. We intuitively respond to it because it represents the absolute best of who we are as human beings on this planet and as souls in this universe. You see, it's, it's, a deep, it's a deep feeling and experience because it is a part of who we truly are, whether we're conscious of it or not. Now, early the big question for those of us who started the spiritual journey is, what is God's will for my life? And we spent a lot of energy journaling about it and praying about it and getting counseling about it. And over all these years that I've been a pastor, the, the same holds true. I've, I've had countless number of people who come to, to, to talk to me about what is God's will for their life. And I believe that Jesus actually simplifies the answer to that question. I do. I, I think because we think in order to have a full understanding of what this massive abstraction, what is God's will for my life, is that we overthink it to a point that it paralyzes us and we don't know what to do or we feel like we have no idea what it is. And when I was looking at this passage for today, I thought, it's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, as I started the great quest when I was in my 20s, and now that I'm in my 60s, I'm looking back and I'm thinking, hmm, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not that nebulous. It's pretty clear and it's pretty plain to see. And I believe that this scripture passage shows us. You don't need a lot of commentary uh, to figure out what's going on between those who chose to show acts of kindness and compassion and those who did not in the parable. It's pretty straightforward. What is God's will for our life? One of the things that I also realized in answering the question is that Jesus didn't go around in the Gospels asking, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? Jesus knew. Jesus knew what it was. Now, at the beginning of his ministry, you had the wilderness experience, which wasn't so much he was asking, what is God's will for my life? But how am I going to manifest it? What am I going to do to make it a reality? At the end of his ministry on the Mount of Olives in Gethsemane, 
when he knew what was about to happen, he stopped and he paused, and he didn't ask God, what is your will? He just asked, is there another way to fulfill your will? Is there another way for me to fulfill my purpose without going through the passion and the crucifixion? And in the end, he says, not my will, but yours. So Jesus knew what God's will was for him. You say, well, yeah, because he was Jesus. No, no. Look, I may be oversimplifying it, but I'm doing that on purpose because sometimes it's in the simplicity that we see, see the, the, the great truths. What is God's will for our lives? When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. When I sick, was sick, you tended to me. When I was in prison, you visited me. But Lord, when did we ever do that for you? The people asked in the parable. And Jesus says, when you did it for the least of my brothers and my sisters, you were doing it for me. Okay? What is God's will for us? I believe it's quite simple. Be kind. Be compassionate. When you see somebody who is in need, then do something to help them. Be kind. Be generous. Be loving. Be forgiving. That is God's will. Now, there are a lot of other things that we do in our life that is a part of our fulfilling our purpose, but it seems to me that the basic answer to the question, what is God's will in my life, is simply to be kind to one another. Another thing that I found interesting in the passage, too, is that in both cases, the, indiv the individuals that the, that the judge was speaking to, they were not conscious at all that they had been doing these things for God. But when did we ever see you hungry? Or when did we ever see you sick? Or when did we ever see you naked? Or when did we ever see you thirsty? When did we uh, see you as a stranger and did not welcome you in? Or we did welcome you? When did, and Jesus in the parable says, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. So what that communicates is that whether we're conscious of it or not, we're linked with one another. That an act of kindness to another human being is an act of kindness to the divine. An act of neglect toward another human being is an act of neglect toward the divine. An act of kindness to all the creatures on this planet is an act to the, of kindness to the divine. An act of cruelty to animals and creatures on this planet is an act against the divine. And acts of kindness and preservation of this planet and all that thrives here is an act of kindness for the divine. It's all connected. God is not in categories. I don't see that in this parable. I, what I see in this parable is God is connected to everything as we are connected to everything as well, whether we're conscious of it or not. But I want to take this a step further. A few years ago, there was this movement called WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? And there were these little plastic arm wristbands that you could get to remind you that if you saw somebody thirsty, you could get them, a, you could look at your belly, what would Jesus do, right? Now, I am not saying it was a bad thing. I just never understood it is why it was necessary. But if that movement helped more people on this planet to do acts of kindness for one another, then yay. But my question is, why would we even need to ask, what would Jesus do? If you see somebody is hungry, feed them. You have to co contemplate, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? Look, everything that Jesus talked about in the parable, he himself did, right? He fed hundreds of thousands of people. He got in a boat and went across to another country to help liberate a man who was, who was imprisoned by mental illness and living among the caves. When he saw people who were hurting, when he saw people who were in need, he said he was moved with compassion. And, and the Greek word for that moved with compassion means from the bowels. 
It, it wasn't of, oh, that person over there looks hungry. What would Abraham have done? Or what would Moses have done? Or what would Isaiah? No, Jesus was moved because he saw someone in need, and he was moved by his compassion, and he responded to that compassion, to that intuitive feeling within his body. He moved from the bowels, moved deeply. Oh, my God, here is somebody who needs help, and I can help them. That's why he did it. He didn't have to, to go into a, 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 a conversation with himself. What, what would God do in this situation? He saw the need and he met the need. I don't know why we sometimes as religious people or spiritual people feel that we somehow have to find justification to do acts of kindness. Do, do we need to justify what we do is because what would Jesus do or what would God do or what would Allah do or what would Buddha do or what would Krishna do? Why would we even need to ask that question? As one of my friends, who's not particularly religious at all, but one of the most beautiful human beings I know on this planet, would say, we do it because it's the right thing to do. You don't have to attach any kind of religious figure to it. If you see someone who's thirsty, give them something to drink. What is God's will for our life? I'm going to share with you now what I think it is. And here again, some of you, it may sound too simplistic, but I'm going to throw it out there and let's just see where it lands. What is God's will for your life? What is God's will for my life? To be kind. To be compassionate. To be thoughtful. To be forgiving. To be loving. To be nurturing. Getting back to the video that I was referring to at the beginning of the sermon... There's a lovely candid moment where it's just Kylie and Daniel in the back seat of that big old limousine. And Daniel's crying. And she said, Are you okay? And he says, and he touched his heart. He said, My heart is so full and I am so happy. Yes, I'm crying because I'm so happy. And it's what comes out of her mouth and the way she says it next that just for me, shows you what kind of beautiful human being she is on this planet. And she said, looks at him, and she says, good for you, buddy. <laughs> I'm sorry. That just touched me so deep. Good for you, buddy. This homecoming dance was a total act of selflessness for her. But she wasn't doing something for somebody who was special needs or handicapped. She was doing it because Daniel was really a lovely human being and a wonderful guy. And they both had an incredible night together. Watch the video and you'll see what I mean. Good for you, buddy. So when we appear on Judgment Day, if that indeed is a literal thing, and when God says, I was hungry, and, we say, and God says, and you fed me, and I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was in need of clothes, and you gave me clothes to wear. And when I was a stranger, you, you welcomed me in. And when I needed forgiveness, you forgave me. And when I needed love, you, you loved me. And when I was rejected, you accepted me. And on that judgment day, we say, when did we do this to you? And God says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it for me. And then God says, then God says, good for you, buddy. Thus ends the lesson. Go with peace and purpose. Amen.